Okay, fantastic. Well, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where in the world you're joining us from. And welcome to this CEDA webinar on employee activism, navigating conflict for positive change. And we're delighted to see so many people have registered from so many different countries, industries and professional disciplines. And clearly there's something about this topic which has piqued your interest in some way, which is fantastic to see. We have about an hour today um, with the possibility to extend slightly, and there is quite a lot we'd like to cover. And although the focus is going to be on the discussion with our expert panel, we have baked in some time for your questions at the end. So please, as we go, put any questions or comments you have in the chat. And if we can't address them today, then we'll endeavor to do so uh, in the days to come. Uh, just to let everyone know, the session is being recorded. Um, so just to be aware of that, and a copy of the recording will be made available to you afterwards. Um, we also appreciate that some of the components of employee activism and the issues that are tied up with it can be quite challenging um, for some people. So we would therefore kindly ask that any discussion that takes place in the chat remains respectful and constructive. So trying to move to the next slide. Fantastic. So what are we going to cover today? So I'll do a brief introduction to CEDA, just for those of you who don't know us particularly well. We'll then go on to explore, well, why are we talking about employee activism? And importantly, why now? After that, we'll move on to introduce the stars of the show, your speakers, before moving on to our key discussion topics, which are psychological safety, the focusing on managers, and looking at an integrated approach, approach sorry, and then finally, as I said, we will get to your questions at the end. So a little bit about CEDA. So I appreciate there's a lot on this slide, but in a nutshell, I'd like to just give you a brief overview of uh, CEDA or our Sunday name, the sector Center for Effective Dispute Resolution. And we specialize in interpersonal conflict and specifically the better engagement, management and resolution of conflict to achieve better and more sustainable outcomes. We focus on the how of doing disputes and dialogue better. And ultimately we see conflict as a force to drive innovation, performance and well-being, provided it is done well. We ensure individuals, teams and organizations achieve this in a number of ways, including upskilling in practical conflict and negotiation skills, advising on integrated solutions to reduce the cost of conflict and devising systematic ways to help with dispute mitigation and resolution. So now on to the sort of meat of the discussion today. So why employee activism and why now? Well, CEDA's recent work and research by other organizations such as Gartner and the law firm Herbert Smith Freehills, as you can see here, indicates that organizations face a potentially perfect storm of conflict in 2024 and beyond. And I suppose the question is why? Well, the intensity and frequency of clashes between employees at an individual and collective level and their employers is increasing. Now this, and this is also happening between um, employees and, and colleagues themselves. Now this is being driven by a wide range of issues from hybrid working and DEI policy pushback, um, you know, anger about corporate action or inaction on ESG, environmental social governance related challenges, right through to intercultural, intergenerational clashes and anger around polarized politics and geopolitical crises. Now, on top of that, organizations are sadly increasingly worried and skeptical about activism and on the other hand, employees and wider stakeholders are more and more demanding of companies to drive forward change within society. And then finally, many companies, from what we've observed, are not well set up to handle these new, nuanced and highly emotional conflicts. There's often too much reliance or excessive reliance on policies and formal processes and underinvestment in upskilling managers you know, over outsourcing of conflict to people function, and finally, a lack of a joined up and integrated strategy. 
However, the good news is, and for those that are willing, there is an opportunity to rethink how you engage with this challenge and chart a better way forward. And that is what our experts will be discussing today, which takes me nicely on to our speakers. Um, we're delighted today to be joined by four experts coming from different backgrounds, each with a unique perspective on this issue. Um, you've probably heard plenty from me so far, so I will hand over to them to introduce themselves before we get going with the discussion, starting with Susanna. Yeah, thank, thank you, Ben. And um, yeah, welcome everyone. I hope you're all excited giving up your lunch break and getting some intellectual um, alimentation from us. I'm Susanne Schula. I'm CEDAS Director of Training and Consultancy. I'm a mediator for more than 20 years. And I would say my passion for the last 25 years is to help individuals, teams and organizations to have more meaningful conversations and to reframe conflict as an opportunity. And that's for me basically my angle for today as well, what we would like to address. And I hand over to the next speaker. Alexandra? Yes, okay, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to, to this webinar and thank you, Ben and the team for, for having me. So my name is Alexandra Lejeune. I am based out of Basel in Switzerland. Uh, I am a financial auditor by uh, background and, and training, but over the last 10 years, I've been having different roles in uh, healthcare compliance, but also uh, a strong and important role in uh, implementing uh, speak up culture and whistleblowing uh, program in different organizations. And um, my, my, my passion for that is to ensure that um, companies uh, are able to have a safe place for people to speak up and raise concern. Um, and I am, you know, always on the lookout for developing uh, the best advice and tips for uh, senior leaders to, to implement that. So thank you. And I look forward to, to the right, uh, good discussion. And I think I pass it on to, to Andy, right? Okay, Perfect. thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Andy Grossman. Um, in the last 12 or so of my 25 years at CEDA, I've been helping teams and organizations to develop uh, constructive uh, responses to their challenges in working with each other and working with their stakeholders. I do that as an advisor, trainer, uh, coach, and mediator. And I spend my time uh, developing and delivering programs to improve team performance and building systems for preventing the escalation of um, conflicts into uh, disputes. And in fact, uh, last week, uh, Suzanne and I were um, working uh, with an organization de delivering one of its first uh, psychological safety uh, workshops, uh, which was a, a, a very great experience. So I'm very much looking forward uh, to the session and uh, working working with you, the audience, who unfortunately I can't I can't see at the moment. Fantastic, thanks, Andy. And last but by no means least, Stephanie. <laughs> Thank you so much. Lovely to see so many people on this call today. So my name is Stephanie Sapunzi. I'm uh, based in Geneva, Switzerland, and uh, I've spent the past uh, 13 years of my career in human resources in uh, very different roles across the employee life cycle. And uh, that in the private sector and international organizations, so very uh, used to a multicultural um, uh, back, um, uh, environment with a lot of different backgrounds. And my biggest passion is definitely uh, fostering talent and empowering people. And uh, from my experience, uh, one of the cornerstones really is psychological safety uh, to enable employees to thrive, to innovate, to collaborate, and uh, through that, in the end, to be um, engaged, committed employees that will ultimately support the company success and the company growth as well. So um, psychological safety, definitely not an easy task to accomplish, definitely not a one-off, uh, off-the-shelf exercise, uh, especially in uh, speaking um, linked to the diverse culture and environments that I've been working in. And um, this is where I see my role to really uh, make sure that there are tailored approaches that fit the people, that fit the companies, that fit uh, different environments to get the best out of people and the best out of the organizations. 
So I'm thrilled to be here today with all of you to share my experiences, but I'm also equally excited to uh, learn from the exchange that we're going to have. So uh, let's make this a valuable exchange for all of us. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you all. So I'm just going to stop sharing and we're already spotlighted, which is amazing. So Stephanie's also uh, teed up perfectly the first discussion point, which is psychological safety. And there are various things that we're going to dive into on that. But Andy, if I can come to you first, because psychological safety is a concept that most people will have heard of, but sadly, it's one that is often misunderstood. And I think we need to sort of get on the same page before we begin. So what is it that you see that people get wrong about psychological safety? And why is that so harmful for efforts around, you know, speak up culture with which it's intimately associated and dealing with the wider issue of employee activism? Sure. Um, I guess there are a number of things we could spend time talking about, but um, let me just highlight a few of the sort of immediate things that come to mind. The, the, the first thing I think that organisations and teams get wrong is that psychological safety isn't the goal. It's not an end in itself. It's basically whatever the organisation is trying to achieve. So it doesn't matter whether you are in professional services, whether you're making um, uh, widgets or um, uh, you're involved in operations. It's really the behaviours and practices which encourage psychological safety that really um, facilitate the goal. So that would be my sort of my starting point really for that. Um, of course, it doesn't mean that it, the psychological safety doesn't mean that it's about avoiding uh, disagreements or feeling uncomfortable or challenging topics. And on the other side, it doesn't justify rudeness or, or disrespect. So it's sort of two sides of, 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 of the same coin. Um, I think another thing is it, it quite often we see that leaders feel that they have to take responsibility for psychological safety. Now, whilst they do have a very much a vital role, um, it's very much a shared, a shared responsibility. And it's it's a team phenomenon. It's it's really about the team. Um, and we've also got to remember that the structures and the hierarchies that are in an organization also impact on on psychological safety so it's you're, you're working with a you're working with a, 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 a whole system a um, couple of other things that come to mind um, heard this thing about psychological safety showing a preference for extroverts over introverts um, that it's something to do with your certain backgrounds um, but actually psychological safety grows very much with with diversity and the different people that you have working within the team. Uh, it's not about sort of individual attributes. Um, and that's because we we all bring whatever psychological baggage we have to, to the team. And 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 it's it's about really being authentic and and, and, and genuine as you can be. Um, two final things. Um, it's not a one-off task building psychological safety. You don't just go in, do a workshop, wave bye bye, and everything is everything is fine. It's not. It's a continual. It's a continual work is process, and I often describe it as people seeing it as a ladder you climb, and once you've reached the top, you sort of throw the ladder away as if it's a sort of it's it's some kind of magic. It's not that. Uh, it's not that at all. So I think those are the sort of key things for me, which I think that organisations get get wrong. And I would open it up to the rest of the panel. Are there any things that Andy's mentioned that particularly resonate with you on that? Absolutely. So for me, it would definitely be the, the shared responsibility that uh, that Andy has mentioned, which is really a very crucial element. So when we speak about um, creating or fostering an environment of psychological safety, this is not uh, the task of uh, HR or of the managers or of the employees. This is a task for all of us. And um, as um, HR or from a company point of view, when we speak about HR, about compliance, governance, um, there is definitely a, a, a strong responsibility there to provide the tools, to provide a framework um, to enable people, to enable managers. Um, and then what comes in next is really role modeling from a leadership perspective, um, supporting managers in the middle management. We will speak about that a little bit more uh, also during uh, during this panel. 
uh, to have the right training to face these sometimes very challenging conversations that they will have to approach um, and to take the appropriate actions and um, enable all our employees and empower them to become those cultural architects, as uh, uh, Dr. Clark from uh, Leader Factory would put it, which for me is, has been a very inspiring um, element all through throughout my journey with psychological safety. And um, from my point of view, another element I would add um, is also managing expectations with everyone involved. This is something very crucial for me um, because uh, it is a challenging task. We've said that it's not a one-off exercise. And what is very important for me from the very beginning is to make sure that um, people actually feel heard, even if um, what they have communicated doesn't result into an immediate action. And this is very normal in many cases because also from a company point of view that this is an ongoing effort to provide the tools, to provide the policies and uh, the appropriate support. So sometimes it takes a bit of time to actually see the effect. That doesn't make speaking up uh, any less important. And um, this is where I really believe that in terms of managing ex expectations, um, being very transparent about the process. So really laying out the steps, what, um, what is asked of the employee when they speak up? What, are, what happens after? Um, how do we protect our employees as well from retaliation? What are the timelines uh, and the steps of getting back to them and where they will, they will actually be able to see an effect? So transparency for me is key here to manage expectations, to make sure that uh, employees who have spoken up actually do feel heard, even if there's not an immediate uh, massive change that comes from it. Yeah, I think often organizations think I have a magic wand. It's called psychological safety now. It was trust collaboration in previous years, and I do that. And yes, they collaborate automatically. I just need to, to say the word or you feel automatically safe. So I think there is a point um, around what an organization, to your point, Stephanie, managing expectations. Also, what is the organization ready to do? And you need to set yourself up for success in order to achieve that. And there are different, as we said, levels of, of safety. But there's principally, um, you have to start with how do you want to communicate as an organization and are actually able at your current state what you can role model. And then building up, because if you, as you said, raise expectations, you can only set yourself up a failure if you can't deliver. And then there's also always the benefit that people are encouraged. You need to speak up. It's like when you tell someone you need to trust. Why do I need to speak up? Why do I need to trust? Um, there needs to be, for me, a reason to do that, a purpose. And, and to Andy's point, it's it's about the outcome so we're working together and, and there is a business purpose in organizations behind that. So I think it's it's taking all of that into consideration and and build, build up and build the people up to want to speak up, but also to, well, we come to that later as well. I think it's to have good conflict because in the end you need to be able to have conversations of all sorts and if you are able and have the skills, we have we work with the three C's here. If you have the courage, the competence, and the confidence to do that, I think those are for me the three dimensions you need, or everyone needs to actually be be able to to function in in uh, adult conversation. I, I I also want to just add something on on what Suzanne just said from from the the how ensuring that you know employees can speak up, um, and and. I, I've read a recent research that says that the the reporter in in speak up cases, they 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 don't respond anymore to the oh you have to speak up it's in your code of conduct or in your code of ethics it's good for the company they 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 are in for what's in it for me like why why should I care about you know my company what's what's the purpose like you know it's so much bigger than that and. Uh, I, I was reading a paper recently and they were like, okay, the, the manager, when they when they lead and when they walk the talk, I, I saw one of the comments in the chat, is like they, they have to acknowledge that they don't know everything. So they have to hear from their team. And with, with what Andy said as well, the, the continuous training and development, teams are changing 
a lot. There's a lot of job rotation, people leaving, people coming in a new team or a new department. So you, you always create this new dynamic in a team that psychological safety can technically never be attain right because you will always have uh, moving moving uh, targets or, or, or people um, but they also you know the, the, the manager they, they have to model this curiosity and ask question themselves and and maybe ask for uh, other you know opinion and and what did you mean here I'm not sure I understand not being so much in the defensive but being in the you know, trusting environment to to create this 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 safety this this net actually if I, i'll just pick up again on on two points that whilst both stephanie and alexandra have, have, have raised um and maybe it's linked to where maybe sometimes people get it wrong in organizations this is not about being fearless it's about having less fear so um Really, when we're talking about psychological safety, the person who is um, who is involved in a particular situation, let's say a bystander seeing something seeing something happening in 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 the team, whether it's between an employee and a manager or, or some other issue, there are two questions actually. The first question is it safe, and the second question is it worth it. Um, there are, and 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 I think that it's the second bit of it that I don't think we can we can ignore, uh, because that's that's the that's the tough bit. Um, so you can you could develop a level of, of, of psychological safety where yes you can feel vulnerable, but ultimately, um, is this going to get you anywhere? Are you going to be heard? Is the manager going to listen to you? Is the organisation going to listen to you, etc.? So there are two parts to it. I'd also like to open up to the panel within the context of employee activism. We've, we've mentioned speak up culture, obviously psychological safety. And these are things that in organizations have been encouraging for years for people to speak up for the benefit of the business to drive innovation, surface new ideas. But then also with the rise of employee activism, you can't turn the tap off when it comes to speak up and say, well, no, you, you can speak up around business issues. But when it comes to your views on whatever it might be, the corporate policy on this issue or you know, the lack of inaction or that or what we do or say here and there. You can't have it both ways. So I'd be interested to get the panel's views on that, that element to it. Speak up, but not about this. But maybe it's about um, mistakes that, that, that um, organisations um, make uh, in, in the whole sort of area around employee activism. Maybe... The, the first one is pretending that there is no issue because mm -hmm. no one is openly talking about it. It's somewhere there usually bubbling, bubbling away, but no one has sort of brought it to the surface. Um, I think the other, the other point is um, it's, it's not going to get you anywhere if you're trying to talk some out of their concern or issue. That's going to be a, a no-go, but that's likely to sort of um, develop <clears throat> further um, further issues. And I suppose for me that the fundamental thing is really you, you, there's no such thing as as a, a as a workplace being apolitical. Those that that that's gone. It's, it may not be in the surface, but underneath people bring their their values, they bring their concerns into the work in, into the workplace. Whether it's overtly or not doesn't matter. But this idea that we're apolitical and sort of completely neutral it doesn't doesn't really doesn't work, really work these days. I I would second that, and uh, and I agree also with what you've said. Then there's no there's no way of of turning off the tap, and uh, that's also something that. Actually, we don't want because if we we also want that diversity, we want the diversity of opinions. We want it at work in people doing their jobs. So we also have to and actually do expect that um, get getting that in different contexts. So for me, it it comes back. I don't want to repeat myself, but it comes back a little bit to managing expectations as well. Um, so we we do want to encourage people to speak up about um, anything they would like to share. 
um, and at the same time also openly share potential limitations because we can do um, uh, cross uh, departmental working groups, for example, to really get everyone's views and and make sure that this is this is considered uh, for the entire company. Or we can do policy reviews where we bring staff councils in, we bring ombuds people in, we bring uh, you know um, members of all the different departments in. Um, and in the end, there is going to have to be that one expert party that will need to finalize policies for the company or practices for the company. So um, I think it, it brings me back to managing expectations a little bit, making sure that we can we can collect those different views. We want that diversity. And ultimately, we, we the, the idea is also to um, to publish a policy or to bring something out that that people that resonates with people and that they they feel they can they can live in in, a, in an environment like this. And um, it for me, it comes back to also being constructive about the comments. And this is something that I value very much in any type of interpersonal conversation. And uh, also when feedback is provided on those topics, as long as the comment is, is constructive, there is something that 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 can be discussed. And then um, hopefully, uh, yeah, come come to a conclusion that at least uh, is um, uh, pe people can live with within the company. But it, it, it is, I mean, you know, when when, when we look at the, the, the situation in, in today's world, right, whether we talk about uh, wars or, or, or political movements everywhere in, in, in Europe, we cannot expect people to remain silent, so they will speak up. Uh, in, in many companies, what I've seen is that, you know, th there are some kind of social social media communication guidelines where, you know, we, we invite people to say what they want as long as they are respectful of, of everyone. Uh, of course, we've seen, you know, increase in, in those political views that are misunderstood. Uh, so, so of course you you have to uh, welcome those and, and and understand as well how you can better uh, train your employees or or even make them aware of the sensitivities that maybe they hadn't thought of before. But um, what one of a, a colleague in another company was telling me that with one of the the, the recent war between Ukraine and, and Russia, they, they had made a, a certain statement and then they had to retrieve the statement and then employees were not happy with the first statement and not happy with the second statement. So I, I think in those, you know, in, in this turmoil, no one can win if we don't accept that we do not have all the answers. So I, I think it goes back to uh, being a bit compassionate as well towards employees and ourselves, and 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 being like, okay, we we do not have all the answers. Let's let's be respectful and kind. And and Susan, like you said earlier, be speak with care and 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 candor, and and making sure that uh, we do not uh, hurt any anyone on that. And I think to that point, Alexandra, um, I think respectful, constructive doesn't mean the same for everyone. So I had recently a conversation with an employee of an organization. They said, what does respectful actually mean? Or what does, so of course, I think it's also some work for an organization. I think an organization has not the obligation to, um, yeah, to create, I think, let's say it, the organization is the sum of the employees and everyone has a certain accountability how they what they contribute to make this organization work and the organization itself has to provide a space where we had a, a, a webinar i think two years ago it was called safe spaces to fail it's almost how to create a safe space where you can fail and succeed but you need clear terms and guidelines how to do that and you need um i see that also psychological safety and, and andy we worked on that more on a team basis so the entire organization is is quite big to tackle so it's individual teams it starts with individual and then with the teams that you agree almost like in a team charter what does that actually mean and how do we want to communicate and how to manage difference there will always be difference there always has been there always will be it's more what are the tools and skills i need to have a conversation and how to listen because we learned from one of our colleagues um, who deals with really tough situations also in the hostage world, you listen to people, but doesn't mean that you have to accept. So 
I think with all the social media and polarization at the moment, you want to cancel someone, you don't want to listen, you don't want to accept, or you confuse listening is accepting. So to help, and we call this navigating uh, towards positive conflict, it's more to enable people to understand how to navigate, how to communicate. And also what Andy said, we are introverts, extroverts, we have different styles as personalities, but also how we communicate. And across cultures, we all work in multicultural organizations. There are different expectations. So you need constantly in your team work on the definition and, and some guidelines, how you do that. And then also to hold, it, um, yeah, hold each other accountable and not to, what, what did you say, Andy? It's not being nice, it's being kind. Yeah. You know, sometimes you need to be assertive and, and say it. But if you know how to say difficult things, then you feel more confident to do it. And there are ways, and that's how what we teach, the how, how you can say difficult things without, well, if the other person, you have no responsibility how someone chooses to feel or react about what you say, but you can deliver it in a way that it makes it more feasible more makes it easier for the other person to hear you so that one can learn and then uh, we always and i stop in a, in a minute that we can move on we have um we speak about the drama triangle you don't want to leave people in the victim rescue perpetrator triangle you want to move towards empowerment triangle where you can help the victims to create their conditions and be accountable you want the perpetrators to be challenges and you want to be the rescuers to be coaches. So you create a different way how to deal with difficult issues and differences. Fantastic. Thank you, all. And I see there's a lot of interesting comments coming through on the chat, which hopefully we'll have time um, to address some of them later. Moving the discussion now on to focusing on the managers, and this has um, been touched on already. And obviously, we've, we've, we've talked about how it's the responsibility of everyone within teams and organizations for psychological safety and dealing with challenging issues. But when it comes to really shifting the dial on performance and dealing with these challenges and opportunities in organizations, your managers are a great place to start. So I wonder if, Stephanie, you could start by sort of from your perspective, why is it so important that dealing you know, both in the short term but longer term, it's important that companies invest in their managers and see them as a really critical part of good organizational dialogue and dealing with employee activism and other issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. With pleasure. So we were already saying that um, creating psychological safety requires more than just a one of um, exercises or more, more, more than a one of training session. Uh, it's really about ongoing support and development and middle managers are the ones that are going to really hit the tough conversations. This is the level where um, they know their teams, they know their people best. So they are also the ones in a way that are best um, qualified for having those conversations because they know their team dynamics, they know their individuals, um, they know where their, where their people are coming from also with, um, with the, the um, specific challenges or issues uh, that they're bringing to them. So uh, what, is, what is really important for me there is to find a way to help middle managers navigate um, those conversations to, to also be able to coach their teams. And um, coming back to something Alexandra mentioned earlier about um, employees asking what's in it for me, this is also where middle managers really come in um, as the direct supervisors also to, to advocate for that. Um, what's in it for me it's for me it's a, it's a bit comparable to you know when you're at a restaurant and you don't like your dish of course you can walk away and leave an anonymous review somewhere um, and just leave the rest restaurant disgruntled or you could take a chance and speak up while you're there and actually have an impact on the meal that you have in front of you right there and um, and for me that's a that's that's a very important point because I've seen employees leave um, companies disgruntled which is very unfortunate um, because of something that potentially could have been solved by um, raising the topic with their manager or, or within the company with any other support functions. Um, so this is where the, the, the immediate action as well comes in. And I, I um, also focus on that a lot in, in um, any type of conversational feedback trainings, that the sooner 
uh, you do something about it, the, the smaller hopefully the issue still is and the sooner it can be tackled. And uh, this is where I also see the, the role of the direct supervisors really um, coming in very strongly um, to have those conversations, to, to create a space where uh, little things that, that pop up can be discussed uh, quite directly before, potentially before they turn into something larger or also to create um, that um, empathy within the team and see, okay, uh, is it is it just me or maybe others are also um, also have the same worry and how can we solve it together as a team? So this is where for me the, um, the, the manager empowerment and manager training uh, that can happen through different channels. So it's for me, it's not just training, it's also about creating different resources that they can they can come back to um, not only psychological safety focused training, but in general conversations, approaching tough conversations, how to have your one on ones. So there's a lot of different um, channels in that space um, that, that can be used also with peer learning exchanges between the managers uh, to really empower them at that level. Thank you, Stephanie. Andy, any thoughts following what Stephanie just said? I pretty much agree with, with virtually everything that um, Stephanie has, has 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 said. I think, in terms of in terms of training, um, I mean, one of the things that I think we at CEDA really um, see as very very important is if if you are training if you are training managers, you have to really train them where they are dealing with real life real life sort of situations but actually under 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 emotional pressure as well uh because you're right they are they are at the intersection of of dealing with the 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 the, the people in the front line as it were and then dealing with all the sort of management layers uh, uh, above so they too ha are part of an emotional dynamic, which um, they need to sort of feel and be and and be and, and be trained in in how to how to manage. So it's about managing yourself as much as it is about managing managing. Others. I think that sometimes it, uh, uh, you see that sometimes it, it, it ignored. So if you're going to have a difficult conversation, training. It's got to be something which is really you feel is 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 difficult. It's not some sort of abstract abstract thing. Alexandra, I see you nodding along. Yes, well, especially with with, with middle managers, right? Because they, they 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 will be the first person that an employee will come to raise a concern, provide feedback, uh, ask questions, uh, and and. I think Gartner issued a, a paper that 60% of employees would actually go to their manager first before using any other uh, channels or like HR or compliance or ombudsman. Um, and, and we find that managers, they, they, they mainly don't know how to receive and welcome a, a, a complaint or a feedback and they, they, they go on the fixing mode, right? I, I need to fix it quick. Uh, without taking the time to listen uh, to to the uh, to the employee, uh, without taking the time to look at the the big picture and see if it is just a, a, a one instance issue or if it's uh, you know um, endemic to 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 the team or to the department, um, the, the the middle manager like Andy said right they, they, they're in the sandwich they, they receive the the pressure from the top, and they receive the the pressure from from the bottom. Uh, because of course the, the their team has to you know they they, they have to perform so they, they are emotionally drained and and often forgotten a little bit uh because we you know we keep on piling on them so so we need to be aware that they don't have an easy job and an easy role uh and that they they are the one that you know the the, the quote walk the talk should should come from because the CEO has a vision and, and, and push it down, but it's actually the middle, middle management that, that delivers uh, on, the, on the vision. So they, they are, they're, they're crucial for you know, the, the right culture. Actually, a good point you mentioned, it's bottom up and top down. So I think if an organization decides we want to have a certain culture, you need to take the people on board. And I think that's often forgotten, like in so many change processes, you don't take the people on board and 
I, I read in the chat there was a question, are managers best qualified or best positioned? Um, there should be both. They are definitely best positioned, as you just said, Alexandra, because that is where team members would automatically go to. So it's supporting middle managers. I heard also a definition. They were called marzipan managers um, because they are the layer in between is to equip them, but also to think as an organization, who do we appoint as managers? Because I know in a lot of organizations we work with, there is a hierarchical system. They never really questioned um, management means you have to manage people. So I think there are different uh, horizontal and vertical management now. Um, but if you decide someone is made a manager of a team, you need to help that person, but also hold that person accountable to do their job. Mm -hmm. And that is an ongoing thing and that can be learned. We know that. And it doesn't mean that everyone will become whatever perfect is, but you can give people the skills to do this and then um, ongoing support, coaching, etc. But it comes back to the team. So if you equip the middle managers, you also need to equip the teams. So invest in time to have a team charter to agree how this team wants to become ideally a high performing team, which is actually uh, equal to a psychological safety. Because if you highly perform, you are okay with challenging each other. You're okay to learn. You're okay to make mistakes and you will uh, contribute and you actually commit to the outcome, the business outcome as well. So I think you, you have then the full package. Again, it's work. And it means that you will um, constantly have to do the work. You can't just stop and say, we've done it. But it becomes easier once you start the process. Um, being a manager is actually much more fun than um, a drag. What a lot of people experience. No, absolutely. And before we go on to our final talking point, does anyone have any final thoughts on the topic of, of managers? And focusing in on them. I, I, I really agree. Sorry, Andy. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I really agree with with uh, the term equipping that uh, Suzanne just used uh, several times. So for me, it's really about equipping managers, and uh, it's also something um, uh, that uh, yeah, it, uh, indeed, managers are are best positions, uh, best positioned, not necessarily automatically best uh, qualified. Um, but this is where uh, really the the company comes in with um, with equipping them and indeed it's it's like alexandra said as well not equipping them to fix issues but equipping them exactly like in in the comment is is mentioned as well to start this meaningful action so really to filter what is it that we can tackle or that we can try to tackle at a team level and what is it that might need to be tackled at a different level so where can i get these support functions from should i escalate it to senior leadership is it is there a challenge about is there something that could be done with more role modeling at a top level, for example, which is also a very, very important factor, because in the end, it's true as a company, uh, we can we can provide the, the framework, but we also need to walk the talk. So what do people see from their actual senior leadership, from their actual um, management layers that that really happens? So uh, also in including that uh, that psychological safety vulnerability as well, which is a very important um uh, criterion for to enable psychological safety. Um, how is that represented as a, at a management and at a senior leadership level? So this is also something where um, equipping uh, exactly uh, middle managers to either have those conversations or to take uh, to take actions or to take it to different levels uh, is really important from my point of view. Thank you, Stefan and Andy. One final point. I saw you you're going to jump in previously. Uh, just very short, it, it, just to pick up on the Alexandra sort of sandwich um, sandwich point, I think that middle managers in particular have a particular um, internal conflict and it, or, or, or tension and is between allegiance to the to, to the team and protecting the team whilst at the same time having a, a compulsion to sort of improve things or maybe even to report wrong wrongdoing and that's um sort of issue around group loyalty and that's something very particular i think for for managers thank you and now on to our final topic which is about taking an integrated approach and i would open this up to the panel but why is it so important that when we come to thinking about these issues and the wider issue about employee activism, psychological safety, engagement, 
is it so important that we don't just view it in isolation or this is an issue for HR or for compliance or or legal or whoever it might be, but actually we join up the various parts of the organization in one systematic integrated approach. Um, who wants to start on that, Andy? Sure, sure. well, okay, you volunteered me. Um, okay, I think where this comes from is where organizations rely on the tightening of policies or over-reliance on policies. Now, policies are important. I'm not saying you, you shouldn't have a, a policy, but policies are, in a sense, an abstract thing. They rely on people actually, you know, working working with the policies. So that's that one thing. And that's joined with another thing, which is a where organizations, you see everything is sort of given to HR, you know, or there's a conflict or whatever. So HR becomes the sort of dustbin of of all of all conflict issues of all conflict issues. And the thing with that is it leads, it promotes a very reactive um, compliance-led approach rather than a proactive de-escalation approach. So this is really about, yes, I don't have to agree with you. I accept what you say, but I don't necessarily have to agree with you rather than it turning into some sort of full blown, but sometimes it actually will be a, 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 a dispute. So that's a sort of starting point for me, um, over-reliance on, 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 on policy and you just sort of tick the boxes. Mm -hmm. And following on from Andy's comments, Alexandra, what, what are your thoughts on this issue? I mean, I, look, I, I, I am in the, the compliance uh, world, but my, my best friends or slash colleagues, uh, I shouldn't say friends, but my, my go-to people, they, they're HR, because they will be the one giving me the tools to make sure that, you know, the culture that I want to embed in the company is is... is communicated the right way uh, they 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 are aware of things and conflicts that that we are not aware from from the compliance side uh, they they deal with all the i call them the, the soft issues with 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 people the conflict resolution uh, and and from the compliance side we we of course deal with you know frauds and and irregularities and and things like that but from from a driving the message perspective we can't do it we can't do it alone otherwise we will we will fail um we we, we have to be all together in in the message that that we want to bring to the employees to the manager to the senior leaders um of course the the, the way we approach things it's different the risk that we are facing they are different but ultimately it's for the 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 well-being of of everyone in an organization so we we cannot go i cannot go on my crusade on my own because i will i will fail for sure i need i need my partners yeah i hope stephanie agrees with me <laughs> i absolutely do and i'm very happy to hear that because as someone coming from the hr angle definitely very close link to to compliance and, uh, and and this goes both both ways. And uh, I just picked up the the last comment on the um, on the manager conversation we just had, which was equipping for alignment to respond. And I actually really like that comment because I think this is also where policies come in, because we really we we want to ensure fairness, um, and at the same time not lose the the human and the personal and the individual aspect. So I think that this is where um, the link of HR and compliance, providing uh, unified guidelines uh, from from a high level point of view from the company and then uh and then equipping our leaders our managers our people to um, apply them in the context that they sit in i think this is this is an, a very very important link uh so that indeed like another comment says that the policies don't uh don't uh, die the first time they as soon as soon as they hit people so <laughs> as soon as they have contact with people so I think that's a, that's a very important point indeed that link, um, and then um, as as uh, we were already saying earlier that that integrated approach uh, also very important that it doesn't all come it might be company compliance HR driven, um, but in the end it's the the people the managers that uh, that will represent it and it will turn it into a living thing in the end and if they don't back uh, what's coming from a top level, mm -hmm. uh, then it's not getting us very far. So um, this also brings me back to something I mentioned earlier with for example cross-functional working groups really making sure to to involve people in 
um, the creation of a policy and the creation of, of, um, of, of directions of strategies for the company. Um, and even if uh, there are uh, experts going to put it all together in the end, and even if not uh, every comment maybe will be will be seen in the final product, it is so important to collect all these all these opinions because in the end, this is how something will 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 come together um, that um, that that hopefully represents the people of of that particular company. I think there is um, also an inbuilt agility because times change and you need a policy is not um, like the 10 commandments, even they are agile, uh, once engraved in, in stone. So it's basically something that allows for um, responding to current situations. And I think there's also a spectrum. I think I saw some comments in the chat about power as well. Of course, um, speak up, there's a spectrum. It's from speaking up about an issue with a colleague perhaps, to whistleblowing, that's a long spectrum. And you need to cover in your policies, of course, clear ideas around what whistleblowing means and consequences and how important that is. And from, from our friend and colleague, Margaret Heffernan, we know from Willful Blindness and Dare to Disagree, um, worth watching that TED talk and, and reading um, her books, means that you need to have a clearly defined policy, uh, what that means. And that comes back that you then develop almost like a risk register for conflict and the cost of not speaking up. Um, that means if you start with small conflict, small C can be dealt by employees themselves to equip them to have mm -hmm. conversation versus when a manager needs to come in and, and offer a third party and perhaps almost like a facilitator role and perhaps then there's an ombuds function or an internal mediator towards uh, if the word harassment for example comes up then an official process needs to start and it's a it's a legal procedure mm -hmm. and then there's the whistleblowing as well so i think there is um it's not a nice thing to have to have a speak up culture or um policies i think there is it, it needs to reflect the reality in the organization but also a certain legal uh reality and, um, and how to protect the CCA employees and the organization. And I think the word balance came up, uh, not today, but in a recent conversation with, with all of you, it needs to be balanced. And we need to um, check again with each in individual and team, what is it that you want to contribute, can contribute, and what are the consequences? And that an employee needs to be clear about that. Um, and that is for me integrated. And that is a continuous conversation between all functions. And especially the C-suite needs to be informed because it's a big cost. If you do not have policies and an active, actively lived speak up culture. Um, and we last week in that workshop, Andy and I worked up with the team. What is the cost of, of being in so-called unsafe situations or not resolved conflict situations? It's enormous from a reputation point of view, from a cost point of view, from a legal point of view, management time. It's it's just, um, it's a business case uh, not to do it. And I think that is how it should be addressed um, also with um, the management. Perfect. Well, we've got quite a few comments coming through in the chat, which is great to see. And as usual, uh, time has marched on. Does anyone have any final thoughts on the panel on this particular topic before we before we move to to address some of the questions? Yeah, I, I think it's just really a, a reminder, um, Ben, that we've been talking about sort of empowering managers, which is which is which is which is which is one thing about part of the integrated approach. The other one is about, um, and this may pick up some of the points in the chat, you know, what, what happens when an organization is um, is, is, is clearly um, seeing uh, difficult conversations, discussions, or maybe no discussions happening between issues like um, you know, the, the, the situation in, in, in uh, Gaza, between Israel and, 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 and Palestine. So there, um, you might specifically want to have a, a third party, you know, an expert facilitator coming in 
not just to, to build and rebuild communication relationships, because that's the that's the sort of end and end, end result, if you if you like, but it's also about designing the processes which are um, which are uh, relevant to the issue. And that is very much, and um, this is where um, I think Stephanie you actually started the, the webinar about managing expectations, because much of those sort of design of, of, of difficult conversations is around exactly that, uh, preparing people for the actual conversation. And probably 80% of the work is, is done that way. And we've got examples. I, I know CEDA has been involved um, in facilitating discussions like that. And the other and the other thing is really around planning, because this is really about sort of dispute prevention. So it's really planning for planning for the 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 for escalated conflicts or, or rather the de-escalation of, of conflicts. And there are different systems and approaches that one one can have for that. Um, it may be it may be mediation, it may be a mediation and a combination. I've, I've noticed someone in the chat has mentioned uh, an, ombuds, an ombuds scheme. And in fact, Suzanne and I are just working on the moment for in, in putting in an ombuds scheme for a, for a, for a, for a, very, um, for a very large um, uh, corporate, but that's all part of a, a campaign which involves um, speak up. So it's, it's really just looking at things much more holistically rather than, and, and, and that's what we mean really by a proactive, a proactive approach rather than having something which is reactive and, and working on, a, on an ad hoc basis. Thank you, Andy. Um, so now just turning to some of the questions come through. So I'm trying to piece together a couple that have come, but one of them that seems to be getting quite a lot of traction is, uh, can you define what you see as employee activism versus employee engagement versus employee conflict? And I think that relates to an earlier question around um, why should an organization encourage energy to be expended in a way that can internalize unnecessary conflict? So quite a difficult point, but um, has any, anyone on the panel got a thought? So define the difference between employee activism and engagement versus conflict. Um, it seems to be sort of that that spectrum of of engagement. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Okay, let me let me have a let me have a, a, a stab a stab at that. So I think <clears throat> Really, engagement, employee engagement, is is for me to do with actually uh, being motivated, doing the job, understanding, understanding what the what the purpose is, and having sort of meaning in your role, and that's that's one aspect. Activism is well, actually, activism can be taken at three levels. One is at the sort of very strictly at the sort of workplace level, so that deals with sort of harassment, um, bullying. Um, pay equity, um, and now actually more so AI, AI and job displacement. So what the sort of concerns around around that? The second one is more is, is broader than that. So it's about you know environmental stuff, environmental um, things. So carbon footprint. It might be something that an organisation is employees are worried about local pollution in 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 in. in, in um, and what the organization is doing and the third is 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 is, is broader uh in terms of related to supplier and customer issues so working conditions maybe it's um someone seeing something which is unethical in terms of how products are used or, or, or services are are delivered and employee conflicts well that I guess what we would say there is that um, we, we talk about task, process, and and relational conflict. So task and process conflict. There's nothing wrong with that. When 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 we we need that, we we know we know we need that for innovation and and doing things better. It's where task and process then turn into interpersonal conflict, and that's where it goes. That's where it goes wrong, if I can put it, if I can put it that way. So interpersonal conflict is the one that actually, particularly, I'm talking about middle managers, they want to be able to sort of deal with and control before before it escalates. I mean, that's maybe not maybe not a perfect definition, but it's the best I can I can do for the moment. Thanks, Andy. Any other thoughts before we move to another question? 
Okay, so one one thing that's come up a few times, and Andy, you touched on it briefly earlier, was this idea or this challenge around um, facilitating difficult conversations around geopolitical crises and how you might have people in your team who um, are from a certain religious or ethnic or cultural background who might be um, worried about the views of other people in their team. So how do you kind of resolve that situation or approach that type of quite difficult scenario? I don't know, Suze, if you want to start on that. Um, you've got a lot of experience with these very challenging issues. Yeah, I think first is to acknowledge that people have different views, opinions and experiences, and you never know what one experienced. So I think that cannot be taken away from anyone. So, um, of course, we are an organization where we learn how to communicate. Not every organization is built like that. So I think it's important to, again, have an idea that can come from employee relations, from HR, I don't know, have an idea how that should be handled, but then also create um, platforms where things can be discussed by either a facilitator, we offer that service, we have done that in in another organization, um, the DEI department invited us to facilitate difficult conversations. But then also, again, coming to the word equip, help people to have those conversations and to have the skills to um, have the conversation, but also how to manage one's emotions and to really seek to understand. So we work with a partner organization that calls Solutions Not Sides. They're specialized in the Gaza um, and, and that Israel-Palestine conflict. They're really interesting methods and ideas how you can have those conversations and you can still have your opinions, your views, your experiences, but you manage to have a conversation where you understand each other better and you get different ideas and perspectives. And I think Alexandra men mentioned compassion. It's about how to have empathy. And um, again, it's a, a it's a process where an organization needs to invest time, some resources, money, facilitators to, to help to be able to do that and um, set some role models. So really, yeah, that, that is one idea, especially for, for these heavy topics. I think there are a lot of other topics and having done uh, also with Andy lots of investigations and and also harassment uh, mediations, it's quite interesting what you what you get from each side. And you think had they spoken with each, with each other much earlier, a lot of things could have been uh, prevented. And I worked in restorative justice years ago. It's sometimes really uh, crucial that you can exchange your stories. So it's often about storytelling, and we learn that from other organizations we work with in, in war zones, how you can, after a war, restore peace by telling each other stories and accept them. I, I definitely second everything, uh, Susanne, that you just shared. And I, I think it all comes back to what's also mentioned in one of the, the comments, a respectful culture. And, uh, and and managing emotions, as you were just saying, and managing emotions is also an exercise for all of us because we're all humans and it doesn't come naturally and uh, we're triggered by different things. And having a respectful culture and a culture of psychological safety, um, one of the ideas that I'm really carrying within me is also to be able to sometimes say, you know what, I'm quite emotional about this right now. Can we maybe have a conversation about this another time? which uh, is also perfectly fine. And it doesn't mean that we're trying to avoid a difficult conversation. It is simply that it, it might, for someone uh, for someone else, it might be a way of managing their emotions right now. And if we manage to build and to foster, which of course is an ongoing exercise, a, a respectful culture and that's a culture of psychological safety, then hopefully we can also get to a point where we will really listen to understand when we listen to someone really to also understand what's behind. And, uh, and and also respect uh, that maybe uh, we, we don't, um, we're, we're not at the same level right now, and maybe another time is better to have this conversation or in another uh, type of environment. Fantastic. Well, we as always have gone over time slightly. I don't know if anyone has any, before we round things up, any final thoughts from today um, or anything that's particularly struck out for you or we can, we can sort of move to, to closing things up. No, perfect. Okay. So back to 
the PowerPoint. I can move to the next page. So if you'd like to know more about this topic, which we appreciate is a, is a mammoth one, you can download CEDAR's white paper on this. If you go to learn.cedar.com forward slash employ activism, I've also put in the chat that goes into a little bit more detail about some of the issues that we've discussed. Um, and that just leaves me to say thank you very much. Thank you to our speakers, Stephanie, Alexandra, Susanna, and Andy. It's been a, it's been a fantastic discussion, incredibly insightful very challenging it's a huge topic and trying to cover it all in in just an hour is is indeed very challenging but we do hope that this will be the start of a conversation with many of you um, and also thank you to you for joining us for sharing your ideas opinions questions in the chat we really appreciate it and it's only served to enhance the the discussion we've had today so thank you very much for attending um the recording will be made available too, and we will also look to pick up some of the themes that have emerged in the chat in some future thought leadership.